We are here at the Grand Chalet, located on Route 23 in Wayne, New Jersey. The perfect location for any event from small corporate events to large-scale elaborate weddings. Although Grand Chalet has been the superb locale for over 20 years, they recently announced they're undergoing a monumental transformation. We have here the fabulous Eileen that is the owner of the new, 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 new Cosmopolitan. Cosmopolitan. So tell us a little bit about this because everybody's going to be asking me, well, you know, Mallet, you here doing an interview at the Cosmopolitan. Why didn't you do it someplace else? Well, I'm explaining to them that, you know, I did a slamming percussion symposium here in 2009 and we had Phil Collins uh, drummer here uh, uh, Chester Thompson and we had Bernard Purdy here and you uh, you guys just so took care of us and so and did such a fabulous job that I felt that we should be here to do this great great uh, 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 streamline of promotions on me and I had to put you first so what do you think about this <laughs> I think it's fabulous great and tell us a little bit about your plans here for the Cosmopolitan um, we're trying to get a more high-end clientele, more upscale, um, going more New York chic contemporary style, and just trying to do more upscale weddings and bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, um, anniversary parties, anything, corporate events during the week, um, so that sort of thing. Does that sound good? I think that sounds really good. <laughs> 1377 Route 23 in Wayne, New Jersey. Um, and it's going to kick off in 2000? We uh, opt to be done in the spring of 2015, um, and that's when we'll unveil as the Cosmopolitan. Um, yeah, we do draw crowds from all over, um, and we work with local hotels, so if people are coming in from a distance, they can actually, um, we can block a section of rooms at a hotel that they can stay at um, if they are, you know, having an event here as well. So. And that's it, because you know the Mallard man had to give the you know had to give the Cosmopolitan a plug because the Cosmopolitan got it going on. Going on. It's Clemps here from D Formalities. I'm here at where am I? You are here at the Cosmopolitan. The Cosmopolitan. Formerly the Grand Chalet. In New Jersey. In Wayne, New Jersey. Wayne, New Jersey. Wayne, New Jersey. And what, what, bring, what made you bring me here? Well, you know, I get a lot of support out here. Um, Wayne gives me a lot of support. Uh, the owners of the Cosmopolitan believe in my mission, as I believe in theirs. Their mission is to keep the customers happy give them a great environment as well as provide all the luxuries that a customer want will want and I think it's a parallel because of the fact is that my mission is to keep real music alive yes real music alive real instrument music. instrumentation yes and who and who are you can you tell the people who you are my name is Jason Mallet Man Taylor I'm a Brooklynite from Brooklyn I'm born and raised I'm a Brooklynite like Jay Z, the rest of them <laughs> on Brooklyn Night, hard school Brooklyn Night. Okay, and uh, I enjoyed that experience being in Brooklyn. Yeah, I don't forget where I come from. <laughs> <laughs> what What do you feel about Brooklyn today, as for from back then when you when you were coming up? Brooklyn has changed. I think everything changes over a period of time. Um, well, where I'm from is East New York, Brooklyn. So okay. that's all the way down by the Belt Parkway, if anybody's familiar with Brooklyn. I'm nowhere near where they got the brown stones and the green stones yeah. and the, and the pe pebble stones, you know. Um, but yeah, that's that's the section of Brooklyn I'm from, East New York. So let, we, let's go back to to the beginning, Mallet. Go ahead. Go this ahead. is what we do on the for, on the formalities. We go back to the beginning. Okay. So. When did you first fall in love with music and, and get into all the music stuff? Wow, that's something. Well, you know, I guess all of us when we're when we're kids, you know, you know, we always listen to our parents, you know, uh, with the records. With me, it was records. You know, my my sister, my you know, my mom always had records around. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, big album covers, you know, that was a big, great promotion there. It's not like the little CDs and the cassette <laughs> cassette covers, you know. Yeah, they don't even have those anymore. Yeah, I mean, you know what I mean? It was like, you know, the big albums. As soon as you walk in the door in the living room, 
by the phonograph, as they call it back then, the phonograph or the record player. You know, I'm going back, huh? Yeah, you're going the back. The phonograph. Now, I'm not going too far back because I think they call it the Victrola before I was born. Oh, wow. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, I mean, you know, she had all sorts of albums there from Three Dog Night to Marvin Gaye to Led Zeppelin. You know, all sorts of stuff, man. And, uh, you know, I just enjoyed listening to it, man. It was really great, and you know. So your mother got you into it? Yeah, yeah, my mom, you know, you know. Always loved music. She always loved music. She always played music around the house. And I think a lot of us back then were, you know, right, playing music in the house. You know, uh, the the Supremes, the Marvin Gaye, the Temptations, you know, James Brown. You know, we get out there, everybody do the Campbell Walk <laughs> and the Penguin back then. That, that, you know, we had dances that were organized back then. Yeah. <laughs> More organized. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't just, like, you know, nod and... <laughs> You know, we call that, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever they do. Just a groove. <laughs> okay, just a groove. So what about the xylophone? When did you, what made you want to go towards the xylophone and pursue that as a career? Curiosity. Okay. You know, when your parent, whether it's your father or your mother, when you're coming up, they're always going to say something that makes you sit back and say, why? Hmm. You know, like Arsenio Hall used to say when he had his show up, he used to go, hmm. Things that made you go, hmm. You know, uh, and you know, I used to talk to her, you know, when she was young, what did she like in the music area? She used to brag to me about the big band eras, you know, Count Basie and, and the Duke Ellington Orchestra, all this jazz stuff, you know, and uh, she mentioned Lionel Hampton. And I was like, Lionel Hampton, who's he? You know, she said, oh, he played this thing that looked like a xylophone. He had the two two sticks in his hand with the balls on it. I think she did call it Malice then. And then when everybody was into the Jackson 5 during that time period, I was curious about this guy. She she said Lionel Hampton. Lionel Hampton. Yeah. So when I, I, and I had already started playing drums a little bit. She had bought me a drum. I had a drum with one. Remember those, the, the snare drum? And he used to have a cymbal that used to come out the side. And I'd be in my room just banging, banging, banging my brains out. But, you know, and that's what got me into the percussion thing. But then she said xylophone. And I was like, wow. That was the beginning. And you just, but when you first heard it, what what was your first instinct? Like, what was your reaction to How it? can a human being stand behind that instrument and make it talk so well and don't miss a beat? Wow. That was incredible. It looked beautiful. It sounded beautiful. You know, yeah. wow. So how did you learn? How did you pick it up, pick up the scales that you, to where you are now? Well, you know, I know you went through teachers. Like, how many? Or you just picked it up and? No, well, you know, as a minority, we 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 already have that natural rhythm in us. Yeah. You know, and uh, experimented. You know, went to different spots and got my ears open. And during that time, it was called the library. It was a thing called the library. And um, everybody used to um, go to the library and look up books and stuff. And that sounds like a xylophone there too, man. In fact, that's a that's a that is a xylophone. <laughs> Somebody playing over me here. Um, so I used to go and look at pictures of Lionel Hampton and the big band and, and look at what a xylophone was, what's the definition of a xylophone, and and all that, you know. So, um, so basically, you know, it became my mission, and I stuck to it. I was like, I wanted to see what it looked like, wanted to hear what it sound like, I wanted to get some people's names that were familiar. That I knew that played it, you know. So, uh, and that was my mission. But do you, you didn't have any teachers? So you just yeah, picked yeah. It up. Oh no, no, no. I, I had a teacher. My, I had a drum teacher that first started out. Scout Mays was the first drum teacher I had, just just to learn percussion, learn how to read the the the, um, the rhythms. Learn and his Scout Mays was my first drum teacher. My mom put me in for about a year of percussion lessons, just on the snare drum. Yeah. And uh, Scout Mays was the filling drummer for this rock group called Cream way back in the day he was a filling drummer for him so he taught me the basic rhythms and then you know going through school in in the hood you really didn't have no you know it was just general general music class you know a little bit of guitar whatever but then after a while you know when the gang started in brooklyn you know my mom got me out of that by putting me in private school for a minute in in queens so i used to transport i used to travel from brooklyn to queens to go to private school and eventually um, I ran across another teacher. Um, I really didn't get a solid teacher after that until high school. Okay. Uh, Mr. Henry Ketter, he just passed away um, 
in August. He just passed away. And when he passed away, um, oh, and yes, right, I forgot. The school that I went to, private school that I went to, was on in Queens, um, on Safford Street. It was, but then I went upstate New York after. She got me out of the city. Okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure everything's on track. So we went out of the city, and I went up to Marlboro High School, upstate New York. We moved up to, to, up to the Catskills. Yeah. Nice. So I finished school up there at Marlboro High School, and that's when my music teacher, Mr. Ketterer, we, we locked. He was like, you got some talent here. Wow. And they had a little beat-up vibraphone in the corner. It was a <laughs> Jenko vibraphone. And he says, he said, listen, come come in. We'll sit down, listen to some Ray Charles, or listen to some Mill Jackson. I'm gonna I'm get you on track with what's happening with the vibraphone. You got the talent, I just need to put you on the right track. You gotta learn how to read a little bit. Guys. And he motivated me to get to the next level, you know, as far as being able to put the, the music education of reading, the rhythmic patterns, and basic scales. Do you still, do you still read music? Or oh not? yeah, I read music. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta read music. We don't read music anymore. You gotta read music. So, d- did you ever get a chance to meet Lonnie Hampton? Lionel Hampton? Lionel Hampton. Did I ever get a chance to meet Lionel Hampton? More than that. <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah. First time I got to see Lionel Hampton play was February twenty eighth, nineteen eighty two, at the okay. Nanuet Theater at eight o'clock p.m. You know the exact time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was it meant February twenty eighth, nineteen eighty two, at Nanuet in Nanuet, New York, at the Coach Light Theater. My mom was able to raise up, you know, get enough money to get a ticket for me and my stepfather for me to see him perform. Yeah. And I actually had that picture. Got to see him. There was intermission. And then after intermission, I stood right where he was coming down out the dressing room to shake his hand. I got an autograph. I got the actual autograph picture from him that day. Wow. Oh, not autograph picture, autograph business card. And that was the first time I met him. Then after that, it took a little bit more time, and I got to meet him out in California while I was in Hollywood. I went backstage with Bill Cosby and those cats. Wait, 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 wait. You got to go back. How were you backstage with Bill Cosby? Well, <laughs> my my cousin is a, a keyboardist and vocalist. He used to be in a group here called Port Authority here in New Jersey years ago in the East Oranges. And they, they got a deal, and they signed and they went out to California and they made their master master reel and then and they signed with 20th Century Fox. And then as soon as their master reel was done, the label closed down. So half the band, the band broke up. Half of them stayed out in California and half of them came back here. Um, Pick Conley was actually part of that band uh, called Port Authority with my cousin, Arthur McAllister. And Pick started up a group called Surface. Okay. It was a famous group called Surface that kicked off here. And then my cousin, um, Arthur McAllister, ended up staying in California and started, he became the musical director for Reby Jackson, um, you know, with Centipede. And he started doing some projects with different artists. And then I always wanted to see what it was like to be out in Hollywood. So okay. my cousin said, come on out, stay the summer with me out in California. And he took me around, took me up to Barry Gordy's, you know, office and all this other wow. stuff. Taught me about Motown. You know, I got to, you know, meet Rick James and, you know, they told me how they were running the business. Barry, Rodney Gordy Jr. And I was sitting in his office and he was kicking me and everything else. And then after the whole summer of doing great things like playing jam session with some of the guys from Rufus and uh, those cats, I was getting ready to fly back. And I think the day before, my cousin's wife was looking at the Sunday paper and said, oh, they're doing the Playboy Jazz Festival here at the Hollywood Bowl. And he said, look, look who's on the list. So they had Grove and Washington Jr., they had, you know, Red Norville on Vibes. They had a uh, different, but they had Lionel Hampton. Okay. And I was like, oh, there's no way I could I leave go. here. I, well, I don't have no tickets, but there ain't no way. I said, you need to drop me off there in the morning. <laughs> and the Hollywood Bowl is an outside event. Uh, they have it's like a big stage that rotates around. So they set up a band on one side of the stage, and then when they finish the band, the, the, the actual rotates. floor rotates. That's cool. And there's another band on the other side. That's dope. So, so I went there early that day, and I was standing by the police barracks. He said, "Look, I'm gonna drop you off now." It was about ten thirty in the morning. He said, "But I, I won't be able to pick you up till about six, seven o'clock that night." He said, "But you go ahead." I said, "All right." 
So I went over, and you know, most jazz festivals, they don't have like bodyguards, like, you know, pop concerts yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I was there at the police barracks there, and I went around the side, went, you know, and then Bill Cosby and Nancy Wilson, famous Nancy Wilson and Bill Cosby were the host of the of the Playboy Jazz Festival. It was the Playboy Jazz Festival then. Okay. So I kind of went underneath, and I was standing on the side. And I went to college up at Berkeley, college of music for a while. So I went to school with some heavyweights like, you know, um, uh, uh, Jean Toussaint, uh, Monty Croft, uh, Kevin Eubanks, um, and Branford Marcellus. I don't know if everybody's wow. familiar with some of these names. Legend. So Branford Marcellus, you know, me and him went to school. So we were cool. So then Wynton Marcellus was on that bill for the festival. So I didn't know that Branford was playing. When so I was standing outside, and all of a sudden they came upstairs getting ready to go on. And I said, Brad, is it Mallet Head? <laughs> that, that's how I ended up getting the name Mallet, man, because he used to always in school call me Mallet Head because I used to always walk around with these mallets. Oh, okay. So I'm standing there, and he's cracking on me. I said, yeah, what's up, man? You know, what's up? That's Winton, man. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, Lionel Hampton was backstage, and his manager remembered me. Okay. And Lionel remembered me. So he said, come here, come here. He said, look, give me a call when you get back to New York. Okay. Gave my business, he gave my business card. As soon as I flew back to New York, I called the office a couple of weeks, no answer. Then all of a sudden, two weeks went by. They called my mom's house because I was living with my mom then, and said, "Oh, Mr. Hampton wants you to to move in with him." What? How old were you at this time? Uh, I was about uh twenty, twenty going on twenty one. Wow. Yeah, twenty one. And he said, "Listen, Lionel Hampton's gonna be traveling to Germany and France, and wants you to can you move in with him because he wants you to help set up his vibraphone." Wow. Was it free? Did they pay you? Pay me. <laughs> I lived that I had I lived he had an extra room in his apartment. Yeah. Yeah, I lived in across the street from Lincoln Center. Moved in, they paid me every week, fed me. I had made his maid would wash my clothes. Traveling limousines. We had lunch with Benny Goodman. How did yeah. that wait, how did that feel? You were twenty years old. Twenty on the road. Twenty one. Yeah, going on twenty two. Yeah, on the road. You got a maid. <laughs> what is what is that? What did that feel like? Ah, it was incre- It was uh, it was just moving so fast. I mean, it was just incredible. I mean, here I was backstage. Now I started off as his valet. For those of you who don't know what a valet is, a valet is a person that sets up the instrument, make sure the music is straight out, make yeah. sure I pick out his right mallets for me. So I started out as his valet. Then after his valet, I'm mean, sorry, roadie. The roadie. Yeah. Sorry, back up. I started as roadie. Yeah, it's intern now. They call it intern. Now. Oh, they call it intern now? Okay, that's <laughs> a new thing. So I was his roadie. Then from roadie, I became his valet. Okay. Both jobs. I didn't drop one. Then after that, I became the 18th piece of his big band. Wow. Playing on xylophone. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I moved in with Because you asked me, how, did I ever get to meet him? I lived with him for three years. Jeez. So I moved in with him. <laughs> Uh, April of 1983, I moved in his house. Okay. And you never left? <laughs> no, no, no. Three, you left. Three, yeah. But you didn't want to leave at that time. Well, after three years, you know, being 21, 22, you're itching. Yeah, I yeah. was learning so much. Yeah. Here I was backstage with Sammy Davis Jr. You know, here I was going to lunch with Benny Goodman. Hanging out with Dizzy Gillespie. You know, then we went on tour. And on the bill was uh, uh, the Barkays, uh, Angela Bofield, uh, David Sanborn. You know, we did it. We, we were doing the JVC festival. Took place then, and I was with. Uh, uh, and here we are, we all staying at the same hotel. Luther Vandross. I was downstairs playing Pac Man with Luther Vandross. You know, um, it was just. And then this guy. It was the first time they introduced this cat, uh, um, uh, Mc, 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 McFern. Mc, McFern. Don't worry, be happy. Oh, man. Bobby McFern. Bobby McFern. Right. They introduced him for yeah, the first yeah, time. Yeah. He came out on his big stage and he was making all those noises with his mouth and stuff. So we all stayed at the same hotel. David Sanborn. You know? I mean, and I got pictures to compliment the whole conversation. I mean, it was just like, and I had to be cool because back then we didn't have the cell phones and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could just sit there, you know. It was better that day. Yeah, Luther Vangelis had talking. the drip, drip curl. He had the drip curl in his head. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you know about that. Ah! <laughs> okay. Nice. So. Didn't you go on, I, I read somewhere you went on tour with Earth, Wind & Fire. Well, I opened, opened up for Earth, Wind & Fire. What was that like? Yeah, August 10th, guys? August 10th, 2003. I, it's crazy how you know the exact dates, though. <laughs> and uh, my vice president there, Eric, Eric Lipsy, uh, he was there that day when I opened up for Earth, Wind & Fire, man. At, at Asbury Park, Asbury, um, 
down in Asbury Park, New Jersey, at the uh, the convention center in Asbury Park. I opened up for Earth, Wind, and Fire. Maurice White wasn't there, but the rest of the band was there. All right, so what do you go? What do you think about when you do, like performing something like that, like Earth, Wind, and Fire? Do you, do you get nervous at all, or do you just you just go with the flow, go with the vibes, and and play? Well, you know, I just do what I do. You know, I do what I do, and um, and I. It is just something I, I guess I felt that for me to be blessed to move in with Lionel Hampton, mm-hmm. for me to have education and playing with you know going to school with Brian from us or some of the greats, for me to be able to have the ability to get behind this instrument and make it talk, you know, and as well as for me to be blessed to have the opportunity to have a great staff yeah. on, under my label, Rodney, Rodney Ralph, you know, Eric Livesey. Sherry Rogalski, got a great staff that is su- supporting the purpose. Um, I got to keep moving. Yeah. Nice. Nice, man. So um, tell me about your albums. What made you want to go into making these albums, like Christmas album, the, the Mallet Place, stuff like that? Uh, okay. Well, um, I started my record company, Mallet Records, when I was with Lionel Hampton. Okay. Uh, September... 15th at 2.30 in the afternoon, <laughs> uh, 1984, when I was with Lionel Hampton. Wow. I started my record company, Mallet Records. Okay. I thought it was a great opportunity to be able to start the label because this way I was able to knock out three birds with one stone. You know, I made it a subsidiary of Lionel Hampton's label, which was Glad Hamp Records. Mm-hmm. I was able, as I was traveling to different parts of, you know, the United States and over in Europe, I was able to take my records with me. Yeah. And get them on the rec- radio stations. So during the daytime, when the band was in the hotel sleeping, I would get into a, a, a taxi cab and find out with the radio stations. Because back then, if you were in Germany or France, all you had to do is say, you know, you, if you were black and played jazz, yeah, you and you're a musician and you got a record, yeah, they loved you. Yeah, that was it, hands down. But how did you get? How did you record it though? I went into a recording studio in the city because yeah. I'm from Brooklyn. So I, you know, I had actually. Um, I was at Celestial Sounds down okay. there on 52nd Street. And, you know, we went in. That's when it was really tight. Because when I started my label, you know, I started at a time where people thought I was crazy. Because there were so many labels out. You know, Jive Records. You know, you know, I was, I was, you know, I was hanging out with Big Daddy Kane and all them. And they had their deals, you know. You know, uh, there was tons of uh, major labels. Yeah. You know, uh, CBS Records, A&M. You know, all the big majors. And they were like, you'll never survive. How are you going to start a label? I started it. I had a P.O. box. Yeah. And I had this product pressed up. And I would put it in my suitcase. And I would go over there. And then when I was here in the city, I would go to the record pools. Back in then, it was called record pools. And I would take, you have to give them like 60, 60 units. Okay. And they, you go to their meeting. They distribute them. All the new uh, wax that's out, they distribute it amongst the DJs, and the DJs go to all the different nightclubs and they play it, and then they send back reports on how good it was. Yeah. So I actually made on uh, up in the Bronx on a, the top top hundred list. I made number eighty five for one of my, my second release. Yeah. So I was spending stuff. I was making stuff happen on independent label, and then even when the cassettes came out back then, I was making. I released a, a release under my a EP cassette. release. On cassette, and wow. they kept saying you crazy. I said, "Well, yo, <laughs> I'm doing me." Well, you was watching, you was watching all the, you seen all the hip hop, hip hop guys come up. So, what was your affiliation with the hip hop guys like? Well, I was trying to find myself when, when uh, Andre Harrell, you know, I'm just mentioning the names. Uh, whoever don't know it, need to need to Google it and look it up. When uh, Andre Harrell made his first independent label under Arista. It was called Uptown Records. Uptown Records, yeah. Right. And he, he, he had a deal with Arista where, you know, hey, let's make a deal. If you have X amount of songs on each artist mastered mm-hmm. and bring them in, bang, we'll sign them. You know, you get them signed to the label and we'll finance, we'll, we'll funnel the money down. So Uptown Records was, uh, they had Stessa Sonic. They had Guy. Group called Guy with Teddy Riley. Yeah, now. I know Guy. You know, they had uh, Heavy D and the Boys. Yeah. All right. From my uh, hometown. Huh? That was from my hometown. Oh, yeah, from home? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Heavy D and the Boys. <laughs> you know, they had uh, 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 Flavor Flav. For, Flavor from, Flav. Uh, from, Public uh, Enemy. Public Enemy. They had Public Enemy. Mm-hmm. You know, and then at the same time, 
they opened up a Brooklyn office on uh, Warren Street. And I used to start hanging down in Warren Street in the, uh, in the office. And, and that's how I met Puffy. He was Puffy Combs back then. All right. And he was doing choreography back then. Right. So he was a dancer still. Yeah, he was. He was. So he used to give instructions to Madonna. Her, her videos when when M- MTV was out back then. Music Box, all that stuff was out back then, and that's how I got to meet them. And I was trying to find myself. Oh, also, I'll be sure and the girls were signed to that label then too. Okay. So then what happened was, Andre Harrell and some of the other crew. You know, I was kind of just up in the mix. Some of them seen me, but then it was Cat Dice. Dice was the man, Andre Dice. He was kind of like the promotional manager for them back then. And he was trying to put me up in there to try to maybe be the musical director for Al B. Show's Girls because Al B. Show broke off and his girls went solo and they came out with an album. Now, if they had pushed really hard, they'd have been what Brownstone was and everything else, but then they had their issues. You know? But I was trying to find my spot. I said, well, I play xylophone. And they couldn't understand. You play xylophone, what good are you? You got to rap. You got to run around, do something, you know. So... I was in that mix, you know, okay. real small, but I was there. Yeah. So when I started reading, seeing how their system worked, so I would take the knowledge from what they were doing, throw it in the jazz world, and try to figure out how to throw it in the jazz world. Okay. Nice. So did it work out? <laughs> well, I'm alive. My label's still going. I got a couple Grammy nominations. Nice. You know, um, I think it's working out. Nice. And you collaborate with some with some R and B artists and things like that. How did you get in the studio with those guys? Um, well, it's interesting. I guess it's like when you got it, you got it. You know, um, some of the cats up at Sony were talking about me, and they they signed uh, they signed Carl Thomas, the artist on the Bad Boy, mm-hmm. and uh, I got a chance to go up in the Bad Boy's house and lay down some tracks, you know, on vibes, you know, and that that kept me alive. That was really. That was incredible. I mean, it was like when I brought the vibe, and that's when the big thing with Africa and all this other stuff, people were walking around with the, they had, then they were giving birth to be girls, they had names like Kanika and Shaniqua <laughs> and everything else and all the stuff. And they had, they walking around with these medallions, you know, the, and they had the flat tops with the, bra- with the, with the bleach. It, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I, and when I came into the studio with this, they looked and said, oh, what's that? I'm like, wait. You you don't Y'all know never seen this. You don't know you don't know that the the roots of this is in Africa? Yeah. You ain't never heard of xylophone? Vibra this is a vibraphone. You ain't never heard of vibraphone? No, no, no. You know, and the, some of the boys from one twelve was up in the studio I seen. I think Faith Evans was down the hall, you know. All the big dogs, you know. You was just in the heart of when Bad Boy was making everything. I was just right there okay. on the edge. <laughs> Still there. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Still there. Matter of fact, I got the original. If you tell you tell tell P Diddy, come to my house. I got the original card, business card, where he gave me. He was trying to hustle me up on something. That's when it went from beepers. They used to have beepers then, and then from beepers came Sky Sky uh, Sky Sky Page. Sky Page. Yeah, the give me a call. He had the 95 numbers. I had to put it. And still couldn't <laughs> get them. You better give me a call, P Diddy. <laughs> So how'd you get how'd you get to be able to play on those records? Like when they just saw the xylophone, they wanted to hear you play. Well, if they see there? me work out and play, you know, they'd ask for me to come through. You know, word of mouth. You know, you good? You got it going on? Or here, Brooklyn night, bang. You know. But then eventually, I worked my way over here to Jersey, and that's how that's what my VP. You know, at the time, Eric Lipsy was working at uh, one of the hottest clubs at that time called Club Eighty Eight, yeah. and that was in East Orange, and he was assistant manager for. The Club 88, and all the stars were coming to Club 88 back then. So they had downstairs a jazz room. And then on Saturday nights, they would have everybody be playing Mr. Magic, and then they would have special guests come up and sing and stuff. And I wanted to play that. I had my little vibe before. I said, yo, can I play in the band? And they said, oh, yeah, we'll try you out. We'll see what you got, you know. So I went up there, and I was doing my thing. And they're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you know. And then I went home, and I said, I'll forget him. They called me the next week and said, you know what? We want to try you again. <laughs> Somebody was like, we kind of digging you. you yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I want to talk about um, Bernard. Bernard Perry. Oh, Purdy? Purdy. Oh, that Bernard was a Purdy. twister. That's a twister. <laughs> Bernard Purdy. How'd you meet him? He's my current mentor. Bernard Purdy. Eric. Wasn't Bernard Purdy a fan of mine when I was playing at Top Brass? 
I used to play at this club that he managed called the Top Brass at the Robert Treat Hotel in Newark, New Jersey. And Bernard Purdy was living out here. And every time I did a gig, like 80% of the time, he'd always be sitting in the back room. And after the show, Eric used to always bring me up to him. And he'd be smiling and everything else. Um, never knew that he was a, a fan of mine. But Bernard Purdy, for those of you who don't know, he was the most recorded drum in history. He's the original drummer for Aretha Franklin. He, uh, he played drums with James Brown and Dizzy Gillespie. And uh, he created his own style of uh, drumming called the Pretty Shuffle. And never know he was a fan of mine. Uh, we finally hooked up and uh, he asked me to, he asked, he wanted to play drums for me. Yeah. And, that, and what was your impression of that when you heard that? Blew my mind. Blew my mind. And then he would hire me, it's even current, he hires me to play in his band. So, so you're still doing gigs with him to this day? Yeah, to this day. Matter of fact, we got a big show coming up uh, with Tito Puente Jr. and Bernard Purdy. We did, we did, we just finished doing one out at Suffolk Theater. And it's called the uh, Jason Malman Taylor and the All Star Band. And we just finished hitting out in Riverhead at the Suffolk Theater. Now, we, in February, February 15th, we're doing Valentine's Day at the Crossroads uh, in Galwood, New Jersey. Bernard Purdy, Tito Puente Jr. And you know, and it's my band, it's Jason Malman Taylor and the All Stars. So we're gonna bust some old school soul. We're gonna bust some a little bit of salsa, and you know, I'm I guess even though I swing, I'm really known as the smooth jazz cat. I, I see your name in the mix with with like Jay Z and stuff. What what is that about? Well, you know, I never got to lay down the true tracks. You know, we met when I was with Mariah. It's really weird because you know it was P Diddy, Mariah, and Jay Z in the house. And it, it was really weird with that whole thing because what happened was they were being honored at the, uh, I forgot, through the Grammys. It was an honorary taking place. And uh, it was December 6th, I believe. December 6th, 2000. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how you do this with the dates. <laughs> I don't know how you do it with the dates, man. No, go ahead, go ahead. December... December 6, 2005, okay. at 7.30 p.m. <laughs> uh, I had just finished coming out of, out of the side room there. It was uh, me and Mariah. They just finished eating in the back room there. Uh, this was at the Gotham. The Gotham, uh, where's that there? Gotham. The Gotham Hall. Okay. You know, the Gotham Hall in the city. And they had the appreciation. It was, it was a tribute to uh, uh, Yoko Ono, Mariah Carey, Jay-Z, and it was nice. It was real cool. And I was there, and I had seen P. Diddy. You know, I said, hey, what's up? He was still puffy now, I think. Uh, and I seen I started mingling and stuff, and and uh, uh, I believe uh, either P. introduced me to Mariah or somebody introduced me to Mariah. So we, we were hanging out, and then I ended doing up a pro I did a project for Mariah. Yeah. You know, I played up at her camp, you know, okay. and she asked me whether I wanted to go on tour with her, and I said, you know what? I'm special. I'm the Mallet Man. I said, yeah, <laughs> you got to put me out front. Uh, you, and you, you let her know if she help, yeah, Mariah, call me, call me, cause I know you're going through something. Call me, baby, call, call me. Call me. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, but on a serious tip, though, it was a great opportunity to work on the Mariah, mm -hmm. and then me and Jay Z, we started talking okay. about some ideas, you know, cause I had just finished with my own club, cause I had my own club, um, and uh, it was called Malice Place here in Newark. Yeah, and we opened that up in 2001. So as that tra as that went through its transition, and I ended up closing down cause of demographics. That's when you know I heard he was trying to do something. And he's telling me, oh, I'm thinking about doing something, you know, blah, blah, blah. you know, and you know, you know, you know how the business is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you rub heads and try to make stuff happen, you know. Um, but that was part of the hustle. Yeah. So that's interesting, man. It's very interesting. So, what what do you think about the music industry now and how it's changed from back then when you first started? You think wow. it's changing for the worst? <sighs> I would never say that. My mission is to keep real music alive. Um, it is what it is, but I know that with the support I have from uh, my crew, you know, um, Eric, you know, like I said, Rodney Ralph, he's my sales and promotion, you know, and the people around me and my fans that, that appreciate live music with real instruments, um, it gives, and, 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 you know, also, I mean, even visually, you know, Sherry, Sherry Rogowski, mm -hmm. she's a great part of, you know, making sure that I'm seen in action at all times, you know. Um, 
And uh, oh yeah, also by the way, the support of uh, who I endorse for. Definitely. You know, I endorse for AKG. AKG is for their. Uh, I endorse for their microphones, their C five sixteens, and the Phantom, the twenty nine, and also the D five microphone. Uh, Mike Bolter, you know, because it comes from three ways. If I'm not heard well, mm-hmm. it can't work. I got to be heard well, so I'm heard well through them. I got to have the right tools to work with. That's my Mike Bolter mallets. <laughs> In effect, holding it down. These are my tools. Yeah. And then my main, my main baby, the Yamaha, Yamaha. YV3400. Yamaha, I endorse for them. Nice. So when you put, oh, and also Reunion Blues, I got to plug them, my bag. You know, I walk around my stick, but you know, my mallet bag. I got to make sure that that's there. So when you put all those sponsorships together and my concept and my mission, it helps. To, it, and like I said, as of 2010, I no longer consider me to be a jazz musician. I'll be honest to say that I'm an entertainer. 2010 officially made me an entertainer. Why? You want to know why? Hey, you, go ahead. Yeah, go. I was waiting for you. You want to ask me why? Yeah, go ahead. Why? Because right, 2010. <laughs> On June seventh at eight o'clock p.m., I was at the uh, um, New Jersey Performing Arts Center, and I was honored to be included with. I don't know if people ever heard of Les Paul guitars. Les Paul, yeah. You heard of Les Paul? Of course. Guitars? Okay. Well, his son is Rusty Paul. Okay. And they did an honorary at uh, New Jersey Performing Arts Center. And he asked, he said, "Listen, when my father was alive, Les Paul used to play with Lionel Hampton." I want you to play and put you out front. I want you to play with my band. So if you go to YouTube and you go on the Jason Taylor New Jersey Pack, uh, New Jersey Hall of Fame, I was on the stage with some of the superstar players in the industry. I was performing with Ace Freely from the rock group Kiss. I was performing with Brad Weatherford, rhythm guitars from Errol Smith. Wow. I was performing. This is all on the same stage together now. Yeah, yeah. I'm playing with Rusty Paul on bass. I'm playing with Steve Lucas, who's the protege of Les Paul. And, oh, also Robert Randolph. Robert Randolph is like the sly guitar man. We're all on stage at the same time. Get off the stage, and I go backstage, and uh, Jack Nicholson, Jack Nicholson, um, Jack Nicholson and uh, the actress Susan Sarandon, Mm -hmm. they they just checked me out in groove, and they were like, wow. You know, uh, Jack Nicholson, the actor, said, yeah, man, I used to know him, but I didn't know he had a, a protege. Susan Sarandon said, wow, you're pretty hot. That's i never seen that like that before, you know. And that made me official because, here I was playing with, on one stage, one song with artists of all genres. So that, made, that, that was the stamp. That made me the official entertainer. Beautiful. Um, but as far as the music industry is concerned, because I don't really think I elaborate on that, I must say that um, the music industry is an interesting animal. I think it's a it's a conglomerate of everything. So there's no longer a genre per se. If you walk down the street years ago, you used to say, "Oh, I like jazz," or "I like disco," or "I like country and western." No matter what artist you go to. You can't ask them that question because they will never give you a solid, a filtered, a filtration answer. Mm-hmm. You know why? Because of technology. <laughs> your iPod says it all. Yeah, you can push a button in your iPod and get any kind of music you want at any given time. So it's just kind of like you're putting in his milk. You're putting tea, a tea bag in there. In milk, you're putting chocolate mix. In the milk, you're putting syrup in the milk. You're pouring a little vodka in the milk. I don't know what. How do you, I how mean, do you describe what that tastes like? I mean, it, I think it's just. I think it's just like beverages, and you just got different beverages. You got some milk over here. You got some soda. You got liquor, and people just pick and choose when they want to drink some. But is it pure? Think about it, because you know what? I seen the transition in the '90s. Yeah, country and western is contemporary. Classical music is contemporary. You see girls that walk out on the stage looking like just like Ike, you know, just, just like Tina Turner, and they singing country western songs. Yeah, is it pure? Maybe not. <laughs> is Mallet Man pure? Probably. Yeah, I'm an entertainer. Definitely. Um, as far as keeping real music alive. 
Yeah, and you're gonna play for the people so the people can hear. Yeah, I'm gonna play. You just let me know. But what about jazz though? Let's talk about jazz specifically. Oh, okay, okay. What can we do to make jazz? Jazz has always been in the front, and now it's been taking a step back a little bit. But what can we do to like really push it out there? Because jazz is the beginning, you know. You don't know. It's okay. I, th- I, I, what can we do? I think I'm doing it right now. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the most forward answers I can come up with. My mission is to keep real music alive. When they see this instrument, that's when they stereotype me. That's when the real genre comes out. Yeah. You see this instrument, this vibraphone, you're not going to say, oh, that's uh, hip hop. Oh, that's disco. You're going to say, nah, he plays classical. He plays corny jazz. When you see that instrument, but then once I play it, then they get all thrown off. They don't know what's going on. Why? Because the concept. You know, I would believe it's not what you do, but how you do it. I feel that, uh, and I have to say, um, if they go to the the formalities.com, the formalities is about to blow up. Because the formalities just presented a hidden secret. Here's a hidden secret. You had a lot of secrets blown on this show too. You think so? Yeah, we had a lot, a lot of secrets. Well, this, this, this. I'm, I'm the hidden secret to the future of music. Okay. Because I'm a niche, nice. and I have some of the baddest staff ever because they're quality. They specialize in what they do. As you can see, you can look around you. For you guys in the audio world, we got some handsome men dressed in suits, <laughs> ready to take on to the I next know, I level. Feel super underdressed. Oh, super underdressed. <laughs> And uh, two hundred, you know, and that, that's the thing. My thing is, you have to work as a team. Mm-hmm. When in doubt, I always say, when you watch your next football game, that that football game is showing you what you're supposed to do, but you don't do it. When I do something, it's the jerseys. Everybody has on a helmet and a jersey, and a position, a form of attack. The way technology is, the computer is setting up the form of attack. Yeah. But not the people, my opinion. So, not to go too far from out of out of the focus, but like I say, by me specializing in doing what I do, these gentlemen can do what they have to do. And from that point on, boom, we make it happen. You gonna play for us? You you wanna you wanna give the people a little something? Yeah, I'll give you a little something. You down? I'm down. You think that you think the people can handle it? The, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to put this one down. You can put that down. Yes. Yeah, Yo, it's your boy Cram again. Another week of podcasting. Oh, man, this shit is fun. Loving and chilling with my guys here. Yo, you can check us on Stitcher. We out there for the Android family now iPhones, crazy iTunes everywhere, theformalities.com. If you got some shit you want to hear, send it to us, player. Info at theformalities.com. Info at theformalities.com. One love. All right, it's deformalities, deformalities.com. Clemson here. I got Mallet Man about to give us a little performance before we get out of here. All right. Okay, the vibraphone. The vibraphone is described as an instrument that has metal bars with resonators that most people call pipes, resonators, on a frame with a sustain pedal, equivalent to the piano, where the piano has those three pedals. Sustain means if I press down on the pedal and hit a note, the note will ring continuously. It's not as long for some reason. (laughs) And The fifth part is, it's optional, is a motor that's normally here. I I break them up pretty much, but the motor, the purpose of it is because the motor actually turns these wheels on the side, and underneath, they're like these these, uh, wings that turn. You ever heard of the Indians when they go, Yeah, yeah. It creates a vibrato sound. So if the motor is on, and that's optional, the motor doesn't make it of a vibraphone, but it, it identifies it because you break the word up, vibraphone, vibrate 
means it's the rotation of the sound. So if I step down on the pedal and I press and I hit three notes, and if the motor's on, you hear that wobbling? Yeah, yeah. It gives a vibrato effect. That's where vibraphone comes in versus the xylophone, which has wooden bars okay. on a customized box without resonators. Without resonators on the bottom. I right, just so get this one off, huh? Go ahead. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Hold on. The the mallet the mallet flipping. Can we just talk about that real fast? What? Before the you flipping the mallets and this whole this whole Chinese kind of stance that you go into. Where did that come from? The flip the 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 way you flip the mallet and all that. Did that just that was your skill? You developed that or did that where did that come from? I know I'm looking right at Roy Rodney. Well, um, it's a combination of things, man. Uh, uh, you know, first of all, when I was coming up, my first year of uh, playing a vibraphone, my mom's bought me my xylophone, which I never did tell you. She, she finally did pitch in and get me my first xylophone. And on Christmas Day on 1977, I woke up at 3.25 a.m. and went out to the, under the tree. It was, no, it was three, it was three, no, it was 3.37 point five seconds <laughs> when I woke up because I looked at the clock and I was supposed to be asleep and the xylophone was under the tree and it blew my mind but uh you know 
it takes a lot to be a niche. Look at Michael Jackson. Why the glove? Yeah. You know, why the dancing? You know, uh, this is my niche. I have a combination of a formula that makes it work. There's a formula. And my first year, like I was saying before, my first year of playing this album, my mother didn't want anybody to take the instrument from me when I was playing the instrument in bars. So she didn't want to give me a knife. She didn't yeah. want to give me a gun. So she paid for a year of martial arts. And this is where that art, as far wow. as I'm concerned, is not really pure because of the combination of them doing all sorts of different types of fight. But I don't mean to go there. <laughs> but um, I took one year of martial arts and I ended up staying there. That helped to keep me focused. Then I looked at Lionel Hampton, if you see any of his YouTubes, how he takes three sticks and throws them up into, puts them in the mouth and spins them around, catches the sticks behind his back. So my mission was to not be like Lionel Hampton, but to be Mallet Man. Okay. So I worked on trying to become me. So every time I play a song for anybody, I don't want to be average. I want to be unique. Like when you say Jay-Z, you say, whoa. You say Michael Jackson, you say, whoa. Because you say Prince, you say, whoa, right? But if you say other cats, no disrespect. No disrespect. If you say, you know, Kelly, Todd, Kelly. Whoever. Whoever. You say, nice, but you don't say, whoa. <laughs> or you look at their legs, or you look at their physique. Anybody can work out and be in shape. But what makes you who you are? You have to take what God has given you and pull it out of you and blow it up. Take, we all have a gift that's implanted in us and what we have to do is pull it out of us. And what you're looking to hear is blessings. Blessings because I have a staff that supports me. I have endorsements that support me. And I'm doing something that I don't think nobody has caught up to me on yet. It's amazing though. It's amazing the way you're doing it. I like it. Yeah? Yeah, I like it. The formalities it like it? The formalities.com. The formalities. We'll love is, it. It. is it the or the? It's the, right? The, the, same word. Okay, all right. <laughs> nice, man. Thank you, Miley. Um, Can you just get a people a quote? We usually end off with a quote, but just an inspirational quote for people. I got tons of them. Just one last one before we get One? Out. Right off the top of my head. Your favorite one. Favorite one. I think the one that society, you know, I've been saying keeping real music alive all the time, okay? But I, as you see, I, I've been with the best. I pray. I stay focused. Technology and society tries to take you out of focus, you know? They make you counteract, counterreact. But I think society means you should react. I'm a bad dog, <laughs> but I'm humble. But I will say, as uh, and I also want to plug Pedro because because of this filming, you know, me and Pedro were at the, uh, at the listening the, yeah, party. Yeah, yeah, I met yeah. you at the dining room, the listening party. Huh? Yeah, yeah. You remember? See, see, see. Uh, Pedro, uh, I'd like to thank Pedro for making this happen. Uh, I'd like to thank you for being able to follow up. Definitely. But what I always say, and you have to follow it. And I said it to you at that night, though. Vision and, and 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 Rodney, Rodney, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Rodney's my sales and promotion man. Yeah. Vision without execution becomes hallucination. Nice. I'll repeat that again. Say it again. Vision without execution becomes hallucination. Thank you.